Today is a celebration. Today is a celebration like none other. When we think about what Jesus did for us on the cross, and we've been focusing on that, but today is unlike any other. Why? The greatest day for the Christian is Easter. And why is that? It's a day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. In Max Licato's book, he said, if it wasn't for the resurrection, Jesus' life and death would have been like any other. But because of the resurrection, we have hope and we have eternal residence in heaven with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This message today, I want to encourage you to go and get a little cup, put some juice in it. Even if you don't have grape juice, that's okay. Put some orange juice or even just water. And find you a little cracker or a piece of bread or something and just put it uh, there by you. So while we begin, if you want to go and do that, that's fine. Because I want to read a passage from John, from the Gospel of John in chapter 20. And So while I'm reading this, you have your TV turned up or you can go and get your uh, elements. So we will take that Lord's Supper at the end. But here's the passage. It speaks about the empty tomb. It says... Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and said to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid Him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and they were going to the tomb so they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there. But the handkerchief and, and that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the Scriptures that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went away again into their own homes. Let's pray. Father God, I pray for this message today. What a glorious day. This is the resurrection day. This is Easter. And it has so much meaning to us because Jesus is alive. And we rejoice in that and we know that fact. And because we know that, there is hope. And we know that if Jesus had just died and He stayed in that tomb, it would just be like any other man. But Jesus was not like any other man. He was God. He was the Son of God. He was King of Kings. And He is King of Kings. And He's Lord of Lords. And we rejoice in Him today. And we praise Him. And we, we want to share Him with others so that they may have the same hope that we have. And Father, today as we focus upon the empty tomb, Father, may it fill our hearts with hope. And so Father, now I just pray You'll move me out of the way. Use me, Father, today to preach Your Word. And we'll praise You and we'll thank You in Jesus' name. Amen. So I hope you've taken some time and, and, and got your uh, juice and, and got a cracker or some bread. And, and as I said later on, we'll take these elements of the Lord's Supper together. But as we focus today, I, I want us to focus, um, first of all, I want us to focus on the linen cloth. You know, when we think about the empty tomb, we, we know that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb she was the first one to actually see that the stone had been rolled away. Her being the first did bring some doubt. Because as we looked at the passage here just a little while ago, we said that she went to the tomb early and it was still dark. You know, she may not really saw or thought she saw what she saw and it being, being dark, but she did see the uh, linen cloth laying there and and it was uh, a, a body wasn't there. And so I believe, some scholars believe that Mary Magdalene um, actually went to the tomb 
twice. There was actually two visits of Mary Magdalene and maybe after the first visit she went and it doesn't say in the scriptures but it's more likely thought that she went and maybe got um, Mother Mary and uh, brought her to the tomb. And why we think so is because in Luke 24, uh, 1 through 7, let me just read this to you. This is another account of the risen Savior. It says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women were with them. They came to the tomb bringing spices when they had, uh, had, that they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them shining garments, Then as they were afraid, bowed their faces to the earth, and they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Remember how He spoke to you when He was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and then on the third day, rise again. Boy, what hope. But see, I believe as the ladies came and they gathered, they still did not grasp the meaning. All through Jesus' ministry, there was actually three predictions that Jesus shared with His disciples telling them the things that were going to come. He prepared them for the day that He was going to rise again when He even told John, if you go back to John chapter 14, 1 through 6, He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And where I go, you cannot go. And Thomas didn't understand it. He would ask questions, and that's where we get the phrase, doubting Thomas. <laughs> but you know, it's easy for us to maybe put down Peter and put down other disciples because of their disbelief, because we know the truth. But in those days, all they could understand was there was nobody in that tomb. There was an empty grave, and they couldn't understand it. They thought that somebody had taken the body. Mary... Magdalene, the first one to go in and and to find the the linen cloth laying there with no body, the first thing out of her says, hey, uh, where did they take Jesus? Where is He? And we see in the first passage that we read, that in verse 2 it says, Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid Him. So you can see right here of her disbelief that she didn't believe uh, the, the thought of Jesus rising from the grave did not even come to her thoughts. She had doubts. But as we read on, it says here that Peter went out and the other disciple, it didn't really say who that other disciple was, but we believe, and I believe most scholars believe, it was the beloved disciple that was very close to Jesus, and that was John, that went with him. And it says that they ran together. In verse 4, they both ran together and the other disciple, that being John, outran Peter and they came to the tomb. And he came to the tomb first. Uh, I guess Peter wasn't a very speedy guy. Uh, John outran him, but John got there. But it's interesting to know that John, when he got there, he saw the cloth laying there just like Mary Magdalene did. But he didn't go in. Why did he not go in well I got to researching that and there was a couple of philosophies or thoughts about it one of those being that he was afraid he had some fear he saw that empty cloth there and or maybe even some doubts like Mary Magdalene too where is Jesus I thought that uh, you know he would be here but he wasn't he wasn't there and so he saw that cloth and I guess maybe fear what I think fear is what kept him from entering in. But here's old Peter, even huffing, puffing Peter, (laughs) running behind John. He finally gets there. But what does he do? Oh, he just barrels on in. You know, Peter, the one, hey, Jesus, I want to get out of the boat! When nobody else would. But Peter, did that stop him? There was no fear in Peter. He rushed right on in. He rushed into the tomb, and he saw that linen cloth laying there. But he saw something, he saw something that John didn't see. Let's let's read it together. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloth laying there. But here's, here's the interesting thing. Then he saw the handkerchief that had been around 
Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place all by itself. Why is that significant? Here it is. I don't know if y'all have ever heard the legend of the carpenter's cloth, but let me just share this with you. You see, Jesus was a carpenter. Joseph, his father, was a carpenter. He learned the trade. He learned about how to do carpentry. We don't really have a lot of stories about Jesus when he was younger, but I'm sure he learned how to build things, make things, do things with his hands, because that's what Joseph did. And so... A carpenter, after he finished his work, he was always so proud of his work when he finished it, that he had what's called a carpenter's cloth. And after the work is done, which signified that the work has been accomplished, the carpenter simply had his way of just folding the cloth over, folding it neatly, and laying it down by his work. Now, why is that significant to us? You see the picture here? You see what Jesus did, what he was showing by this simple folding of this handkerchief laying next to the linen cloth. You see, he, he folded it over neatly and he laid it by the linen cloth. You know what that signified? Jesus' work was done. He would completed it. He had done exactly what he said, that he was going to die on that cross, that he was going to raise, he was going to rise again on the third day. On the third day, he rose victorious. And so that's why we can rejoice today, because we know that he is alive. But let's look further, because still the, the disciples, Mary Magdalene and the other disciples, still had doubt. They still were wondering, you know, how is this possible? Where is Jesus? In verses 8 and 9, let's, let's read that together again. It says, Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and saw and it said, he believed. John, all of a sudden, went in for himself. And it was immediate belief. Hey, all these things that Jesus has been telling us. It's like a light came on. You hear the light go ding, 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 ding. Well, it came on in John's head, in his heart. Because he saw that, that cloth laying there. And he, and he saw that Jesus was not there. And it said, he believed. When I hear the words, he believed, that means that he knew that Jesus had done exactly what He said He was going to do. And He had a peace within Him. And after that, it says in verse, in verse 9, it says, For yet He did not know the Scripture that He might rise again from the dead. But in verse 10 it says, Then the disciples went again to their own home. So they left. Did they go rejoicing? Did they go celebrating? In a way, yes. In a way, could uh, Peter still have had some doubt in his own mind? That's very well possible. But I want us to read on because in John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18, there's what Paul Harvey, and I always use Paul Harvey because he says, here's the rest of the story. <laughs> it says, but Mary stood outside by the tomb. That's Mary Magdalene, not Mary, Jesus' mother. And she was out there weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looking into the tomb. So she was still there. The other disciples were gone. She was there by herself. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. So there they were in the tomb. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. You know, I... I couldn't imagine this. This, this had to be a, an awesome sight. Two angels inside of, of the, uh, the tomb, and, and here is Mary Magdalene coming in and, and wondering, you know, okay, I, I've got them filled with all these doubts. I still haven't bought into this thing that Jesus is alive yet, but yet I'm hearing two angels tell me, it's like, don't be afraid. <laughs> angels said that a lot through history, didn't they? Even to the shepherds when they announced Jesus' birth. <laughs> They said, don't be afraid, and here out of nowhere they, they appear, and these shepherds were pretty afraid. I think if I was a shepherd out in the middle of nowhere and saw two beaming angels uh, talking to me, I think I'd be a pretty, pretty afraid too. But the thing is, they, 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 they said this, you know, don't be afraid. Then they said, woman, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? And she said, because they had taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid Him. So you can see in verse 13 that there was still doubt in Mary Magdalene. It was going to take something really special to happen for her to come to a belief 
and it's about to happen. Let's read on. In verse 14, it says, Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus. Now she didn't realize it was Jesus yet. It's just in the verse here. Standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me, where have you laid him? And I will take him away. You can see right here, even in the speaking, that she still did not realize. Why did she not realize there that this was Jesus? Don't you think she would have understood through His voice that, hey, I've heard Jesus speak a lot of times. This is the voice of Jesus. Why don't I believe? She was still thinking somebody else. He was a gardener. And so, another thought of why she may not have believed is some people think uh, that her eyes were filled with so many tears and, and grief that her eyes were a little foggy. It was still morning. It was still early. It was dark. So that might be another thought is she just saw an image of somebody because I believe if she could have really truly seen Jesus standing there, you know, that she would have said, oh, this is Jesus. But yet she still didn't believe. But here is something I don't want you to miss and it's in verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. That was a phrase out of respect. Teacher, master. And Jesus said this in verse 17. said to her, Do not cling to me. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. It wasn't all of that but it was just that simple word, Mary. That's probably something that she had heard so many other times. Not all the other words that sunk in, but it was the simple mention of her name that brought her to, to understand, this is Jesus. Why is that significant? Well, when I think about it, I also think of this, you know, and let, let me just share this with you. Because when I think about her, him simply saying the word Mary, I think about how sheep know the voice of their shepherd. And that's exactly what happens here. In John 10.4 it says, And his sheep know his voice. And Mary was actually the first to witness Jesus being alive physically. Boy, what a special time this must have been for Mary Magdalene to be the first. And then, of course, in verse 17, it says that she went to cling to Him. And Jesus didn't want her to. And I, 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 I tried to look up some reasons why. And this is one of the main reasons I believe most scholars believe that she didn't, or He didn't want her to, was that He said He needed to be untouched before He ascended to heaven. Some other scholars believe that he didn't want her to cling to him because there was not a lot of time that he had to get on with telling others that he was alive before his time to ascend. But in verse 18, he gave Mary something very important to do. Let's, let's read that. And uh, in verse 18, it says, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. She had, you might want to say, she was one of the first evangelists. <laughs> Think about it. First one to tell them, hey, Jesus is alive. He's not in the tomb. He's not, he's not dead. He is risen. He's risen indeed. Can you imagine her being the first missionary to tell the very fact that Jesus is alive? Mary Magdalene, of all people. <laughs> you think, why not a king? Why not some royalty? Why not even the disciples? Why not Peter? Why not John? But after all, it was Mary Magdalene who was the first evangelist, you might say, of telling the truth that Jesus is risen. i got a little story I want to share with you, and then of course I want us to take the Lord's Supper, but 
this is a story that I found, and uh, you might know now they have what they call the resurrection eggs, and each of them has a symbol of, of Jesus' uh, death and resurrection and all. Well, there was a day a Sunday school teacher had asked her children to bring in a plastic egg, just a simple plastic egg, and in this egg I want you to put some kind of reminder of what Jesus did for us and what the resurrection means to you. And so the children went out and they, the next week and they gathered their uh, plastic eggs. And one child had a tiny flower and the teacher spoke about how new life brings forth new life. And that represents Easter, that we have new life in Christ. Another child had a crayon picture of Christ that was in the egg just to symbolize that how much Jesus meant to him. And then another one had a small nail placed in the little plastic egg to represent the price that Jesus paid for us on the cross. But then the teacher became a little dumbfounded when she looked and she there was a boy in the class, a seven-year-old little boy named Brian. He was a mentally challenged boy and he brought an egg. But in the egg there was nothing. There was nothing. The teacher said, well, I asked you, Brian, to put something in the egg to symbolize you know, what Easter means to you. <laughs> the little boy said, well, it, it symbolizes a lot, teacher. It, it symbolizes that it's empty because there's no one in the tomb. Jesus isn't there. And it's empty. The other class just got really quiet and and the teacher, the Sunday school teacher, just formed some tears in her eyes. And she says, Brian, you're right. I think you brought the best egg of them all. Because you told us the real meaning of Easter. That Jesus is not there. That He is alive. And she put her arms around Brian and just gave him a big hug. And you know what? I believe before even the class let over, I believe most of the children had some tears in their eyes too. Because Brian taught them the most important lesson of all, that Jesus is alive. Before Jesus went to the cross and before that glorious day, the resurrection as we celebrate Easter, Jesus took some time with His disciples. And it was a time of gathering as they took what we call the Lord's Supper. So at this time right now, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper, and I hope you have your elements with you, and we will do that. But I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 26. And this is what it says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And at this time, Jesus, he took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it. And he said, as it says in verse 24, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup. He took the cup and he lifted it before his disciples. And he said, this is the cup, the new covenant in my blood. Take ye and drink ye all of it. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after it says the disciples, they went out rejoicing. They went out praising God, thanking Him for that time together but not really fully knowing and understanding what they had just taken. But we also can go out today rejoicing today because Jesus is alive. He is alive in our hearts and in our lives. And we have a message that we can go and take out to the world 
and tell them that Jesus is alive. I want us to say something together today as we close. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Will you say that with me? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's say it again rejoicing. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Boy, we have a lot to rejoice about. And I pray that you'll find God's blessings in your life and that we will go out and tell the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this time, this celebration today, the Lord's Day, this day where you rose again. You said on the third day you would rise, and you did. And you live and reign in the hearts and the lives of your people. And we rejoice today in you. My prayer today is that everyone who is listening knows you as Savior and Lord. There's been a time in their life when they said yes to Jesus Christ and they invited Him in their heart. And so Lord, that's my prayer today is that you know that you know that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You have a blessed day. God bless you each and every one.